As swine flu continues to spread across the world, so do theories about its origin. U.S. investigative journalist and RT contributor Wayne Madsen says he's gathering more and more evidence that the H1N1 virus started out in a lab. Well, he's now in Washington with RT's Priya Shrida. Uh, Priya, uh, tell us, what new proof is there to support this theory? That's right, Bill. Well, we've been talking a lot about the swine flu in the past couple months, and just recently the first shipment of the swine flu vaccines have been available in the United States. But now we're learning more information on how the H1N1 virus actually came to exist here in this country. And joining me to talk more about it is RT contributor and investigative journalist Wayne Madsen. Wayne, thanks so much for joining me. So first of all, tell me, um, what have you learned about how the H1N1 virus came to exist here in this country? Well, it's very apparent that there's three uh, research centers involved in the uh, development in a laboratory of the 1918 Spanish flu, which was actually resurrected. Uh, the proper name should be the Jurassic flu. It was uh, uh, resurrected from the DNA extracted from a, an Inuit woman who died of this uh, pandemic in 1918 in Brevig Mission, Alaska. Uh, the material was taken to several laboratories and what I've discovered is that uh, three particular laboratories are very much involved in this research. The uh, University of Madison at Wisconsin, the National Microbiology Laboratory in Winnipeg, Manitoba, and something that might surprise a lot of people, the St. Jude's uh, Veterinary Research Laboratory uh, in Memphis, Tennessee. So we have three places now that seem to be ground zero for the research uh, that led to the redevelopment or resurrection of the 1918 Spanish flu. And, I mean, how exactly did this happen? This is the 21st century. I mean, how could something, how could these gene sequences get manipulated and then be disseminated throughout the country? Well, apparently what we are seeing is this could have been the product of some overzealous research on the part of the research scientists, the microbiologists, or there may be something more sinister. Uh, the University of Wisconsin in Madison uh, has an interest in a company called Flugen, which is, stands to make an awful lot of money uh, from a method that they developed to deliver the vaccine for H1N1. Uh, so uh, the, the other thing is in, in 2001, at the height of the anthrax attacks in this country, a, a Harvard microbiologist named Dr. Don Wiley, who was on a scientific advisory board of St. Jude's, uh, died. They say he jumped off a bridge into the Mississippi River in Memphis after he attended a banquet in his honor. Uh, it, all indications are that was not a suicide. Uh, the, even the Shelby County, Tennessee coroner uh, came to the conclusion that it could have been a murder, but it was never investigated by the FBI as a murder. Uh, what I do know about Dr. Wiley is uh, after his death, and, uh, the Royal Canadian Mounted Police contacted the Memphis police with a story about bioterrorism, and it involved the National Microbiology Laboratory in Winnipeg, Manitoba, one of the centers that uh, has been very key in the development of this new strain of H1N1. So this is some pretty scandalous stuff that you're saying. I mean, is it being investigated, and how can, you know, the United States um, prevent this from happening in the future? Well, I think what we have here is a situation with bioethics. Um, they talk a good game in the research, medical research community about bioethics, but it doesn't seem like there's any method to enforce the ethics. And if, in fact, this was developed to make money for certain biopharmaceutical companies, of course, this is a case of uh, bioterrorism. It may be bioterrorism saw, but many people have died around the world from this. Right now, it doesn't appear uh, that the FBI or any other law enforcement agency is actively investigating it, uh, which brings, uh, brings up the anthrax case, which uh, some people say that was not adequ adequately investigated either. And so there were obviously some major things that went wrong with this research, but did anything good come out of it that we could maybe use now? that well, it's been, you know, disseminated. The research community, of course, involved with this research will say that this, uh, this H1N1 was redeveloped uh, as a method to combat a resurrection of the pandemic of 1918. But we have several cases. We had a case in May where uh, a, a scientist from the National Microbiology Laboratory in Winnipeg was caught bringing uh, Ebola and HIV DNA across the U.S.-Canadian border at Pembina, North Dakota, was arrested, apparently was freed. He was on his way to the National Institutes of Health right outside of Washington, D.C. There also was a case uh, where a Japanese researcher involved in the same research was caught taking H1N1 DNA 
out of Surabaya Airport in Indonesia to Japan. Japan is also involved in some of this research. Some pretty interesting revelations, and we'll certainly keep you updated on anything we hear from Washington, D.C. I'll be back here next hour for another live update, but for now, Bill, it's back to you. Priya, thanks very much indeed. Uh, our correspondent Priya Shrida talking to U.S. investigative journalist Wayne Madsen live from Washington. As Priya says, more from her a little later in Washington. Thank you.